I want to talk about the fact, and then we're going to we're going to pray for each other. I want to talk about the fact that you can either be trapped, trapped, or t or you can turn. Who has felt trapped at times? I have. Yeah. At times you feel trapped financially. At times you feel trapped in a relationship you can't get out of or a workplace you can't get out of or a situation. But there's that feeling of being trapped and it's like, oh, I'm not quite sure, I can't see anything. Um, and it's, it's so we can either be trapped or we can turn. So I just want to talk a little bit about this today because in the, in the times that are coming, you need to know your authority. You need to know that it's not about how much you pray. It's not about how much you study the word. It's not about generational cleansing, which we do. It's not about courts of heaven, which we do. But the authority comes through the name of Jesus Christ. That's where the authority is. It's in that name that name above every name, the authority comes through Jesus because he said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So all the authority comes through Jesus. Now we do do things like bloodline cleansing when it's, when it's appropriate. We do do things like courts of heaven when it's needful. Not saying we don't do that. But what I'm saying, if we're looking at that to be the authority, we've got it wrong. If we're looking at how much we pray or how spiritual we feel or the anointing on our life, we've got it wrong. The authority only comes through Jesus Christ because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. The power belongs to the Holy Spirit, but the authority comes from Jesus Christ. So we're going to have to know how to walk in authority and how to release the power. And, uh, and one of those is, is in you're going to come into situations where it seems like you are trapped. <laughs> I'm not prophesying that over you. I'm not cursing you with that. I'm just saying life sometimes does that. And we can feel like we're, I don't know which way to turn. You know, the vaccine mandates have done this and I'm not quite sure what I can do for a living. Um, although I think it was Friday or Saturday that the mandates have been lifted off teachers. Teachers no longer have to be have the vaccination to work in schools anymore. And Sorry? And the, airport. and the airport. So things are turning around. There's a change. Um, but we need to ride this. We need to ride the change and continue to enforce the authority. So it's recognising that sometimes things happen and we think, oh, my gosh, where do I go from here? I've been caught in it. I mean, it's, it's just people get caught, we just get caught in it. And you've seen this before, I've, I've preached this before, but it's been a while. E plus R equals O. The event plus the response or the reaction equals the outcome. It's all the way through the Bible. The event is what happens. It has happened. Lazarus died. The axe head sank to the bottom of the river. It happened. You can't, you know, it's, it's happened. You can't undo it. It's happened. E is the event. R is the reaction or, or the response. And, and O is the outcome. So when the event happens, we sometimes think, oh, that's it, Lazarus is dead. Oh, the axe head has sunk to the bottom of the river. Oh, we've only got five loaves and two fish and 5,000 people. We can't feed anybody. Sometimes when the event happens... We can't see a way out. We can't see anything else. And so the outcome, because of our reaction, the outcome is always negative. But the response or the reaction is the hinge because the outcome can change. Yeah. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The axe head floated to the, the top of the river and connected with that piece of wood that the prophet threw in. Jesus prayed over the five loaves and the two fish and they multiplied. And so outcomes can change. All because you've, you've been unemployed or you've lost your job or you've got a doctor's diagnosis over your life does not mean that is the outcome. That is just what has been spoken and that is subject to change. And so the event has happened. You've got the doctor's diagnosis on your life or the bank account that says oh, you're in the red or whatever, it, or the toxic relationship that no matter what you do, you just can't get out of. That has happened. But it's the R, it's the response, it's the reaction, it's what we do, whether we resign ourselves to it. What it's, it's, 
that, that is the hinge that changes the outcome. Does that make sense? So anything that happens in your life is not, it's subject to change. Yeah. It's subject to change. So in what we looked at last week in 2 Kings chapter 4 with the um, Shunammite woman. So sometimes when we feel trapped, it's in that hallway. You know those hallways that we talk about in the spirit realm? We're in that hallway. This door has shut. That door has not yet opened and there doesn't seem to be any light in the hallway. There's no windows. There's like, I'm in the hallway. But what it is, is quite often it's, we're either trapped between the impossible and the promise of God. That's where we feel trapped. This looks impossible. But God's word says this. So we seem to be trapped between the impossible and the promise. And so our response determines our outcome. Are you going to turn to the promise or are you going to turn to the impossibility of change? There is a hinge in every situation and circumstance. There is a hinge in every relationship. There's a hinge that, that you open or shut that determines the outcome. So with the Shunammite woman, um, you know, she had made room for the man of God. She'd been blessed by the man of God. She'd become pregnant. She had a son. You know, like everything is wonderful, everything. They're wealthy, influential family to start off with. We looked at her last week in 2 Kings chapter 4. And everything, she's wealthy, influential, she's prosperous. The only thing she didn't have was a son. Elisha came. He said, what do you want? She said, oh, no, I'm good. But the servant said, oh, she hasn't got a son. So Elisha prayed. She got a son. But then the son went out to join the father in the harvest field and was struck down and died. An event. Death. An event. She could have resigned herself to that event. She could have reacted in, in anger, an explosion of grief, Man of God, if he'd never come into my life, I wouldn't have had to go through this. I wouldn't have had a son and wouldn't have been taken away from me, that the whole thing. And I know the pain of that because I've buried a daughter. So I understand there's all these kind of emotions that rage in a mother's, in a mother's heart and a father's heart when a child is no longer there. And so the event has happened, but her response changed the outcome. Now, I'm not going to beat myself up because... I didn't have the right response when my daughter died or anything because I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know I was just a, a Catholic. You know, my daughter died. I thought that was it. I know she's in heaven. I'm going to be with her. Um, it's awesome. I've seen her in the cloud of witnesses. But I'm not going to beat myself up because I did not know what is available to me because I wasn't a Christian back then. Or sometimes we might be Christians, but we don't really know what's, what has been given to us. And so the, the son died. Her response was, I'm going to the man of God. I'm going back to God who gave me this in the first place. He gave me my child. I'm going back to him. And so she, um, this, this part here, the, uh, she didn't tell her husband what had happened. She didn't tell the servants what had happened. She just laid her son on the prophet's bed and said, get me to the man of God quickly and easily. So her response changed the outcome. Does that make sense? So your response, like when you, you've, you've got your, your super out and there's not enough to pay the rent, our response, I'm either going to turn to, it's just impossible, or I'm going to turn to God. The E plus R equals O, it works in every situation. The event plus your response or your reaction, which is, would be a negativity, will change the outcome. Sometimes we become resigned. Instead of reacting, we are resigned to it. And that changes everything. So um, it's, it's recognising that your response is determined by your words, by your actions. And, uh, and expectations. And expectations. 
the impossible sometimes seems to be irreversible, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Lost your job, not enough money, whatever it might be, it sometimes seems to be totally irreversible. However, with God, all things are possible. And if you, I haven't got it written down, but if you write down impossible and you write an apostrophe between the I and the M and you put a space between the M and the possible, it's I'm possible. That's what, an impos that's what impossible really says, I'm possible, because all things are possible with God. But we've got this, this mindset that comes from the world. We've got this mindset that changes things. We've got this mindset that is still part of the old creation. It's not part of the new. And so our mindset battles us when we try to live from the spiritual point of view. But an impossibility is really a possibility because all things are possible. We can either feel trapped or we can choose faith. Come on. It's, it's that, you know, regardless. What we have, and, and if you've ever read Viktor Frankl's book on, um, I can't remember the name of it now. Man's yeah, Man's Search for Meaning. If you've ever read his book, you know, how he kept himself uh, expectant that things would change when he was even in a, in a concentration camp. You know, it's just an incredible story. Um, I've read, oh, The Happiest Man, the story of one of Australia's richest men who was a Jew and what he went through um, with the concentration camps, with uh, being on the run, how he, you know, had to hide from the Germans, uh, all, all his whole life story, how he, ca how he chose to be happy with what he went through is an absolute, like, miracle. But he, he, is, he was known just before he died in Australia as the happiest man, and yet he went through hell on earth. But it was his choice. And that's one thing that the devil will try to tell you you do not have. He will try to tell you you do not have a free will. He will try to tell you that it's an impossible situation. There's no way out. Why don't you just give in to it? Why don't you just lie down and just accept what life has given you? That's what the devil will do. He will, you know, he's already, he's already got the free will of the people in the world. There is no free will outside of God, really. Yeah. You're under the, the, um, the hand of God or you're in the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness brings its own enslavement. Yeah, enslavement and things. And, you know, we watch the news and we get caught up in what's happening and all of that kind of stuff. The thing is that you have a free will and you are free to choose. Yeah. It's just sometimes we don't really think we are, have a choice. You know, we can look at a situation and think, well, I don't really, there's no choice here. Mm -hmm. The house is going to be repossessed or this is going to happen or that it doesn't seem to be a choice. There is always a choice. We either turn to fear or we turn to faith. We either turn to the impossibility and surrender to it or we turn to God who makes all things possible and we, we step out of where we are. You do not have to accept what life gives you. You do not have to accept doctor's diagnoses, bank statement accounts. You don't have to ex accept statements over your life that have come from people. Your parents might have said you'll never amount to anything. You know, you'll never be any good. You don't have to accept any of those things. You don't have to accept one tag that is on your life that has not come from God. You have a free will. But it's this thing here. It's the R. It's either your response. How are you responding to God? How are you responding to faith? Are you responding that will change the outcome? If you don't change your response, the outcome will not change. It will stay as negative as the event. Am I making sense? Yeah. So when you walk into situations that look like this is this is going to be permanent, this, this is a done deal, and it's negative, you walk in knowing that what comes out of your mouth is going to change yeah. the outcome. So don't you say one word. If you can't think of anything positive to say, shut it. <laughs> Just zip it until you've heard you've got peace in your heart and you can speak life because there's only two things that come out of our mouth and that's death and life. And so that response, if you if you in that, you know, the event has happened and out of your mouth comes, oh, my God, there's no way this can be fixed. Guess what? The outcome is there is no way this can be fixed. But if the event has happened... And you, you, your response is, all things are possible with God. I am turning to God. 
you change the outcome. You change the outcome. And I have been saying quite a bit lately, God, I'm turning to you. Yeah, amen. I'm turning to you. Yeah. I'm turning away from that from what I see. I'm turning away from what's being said to me. I'm turning away from my emotions and I'm turning to you. Because yes. I want that outcome that you have for me. Remember when King when David was on the run from King Saul? And um, he knew Saul was um, sleeping in a cave or something and he snuck in with his sword and he was going to kill him. Yeah. The event was he had been talked into murdering Saul because how else are you going to become king? You've been prophesied over your life you're going to be king. It's been told you that you're going to be king. But you have been on the run from King Saul for so long. It's almost going to be like an impossibility for you to take the throne. And so when, when his, um, his men around him say, well, Saul's in there and they talk him into taking the sword and going in, if he had continued to carry through the event that had been whispered into his ears by his men, he would I doubt if he would have been king because he would have killed King Saul and you cannot take a kingdom based on a murder. But he went in and he just cut off a bit. He was convicted by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we can be convicted by the Holy Spirit and you know what happens? I don't know about you, but there are times when I have not responded to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which has got me into a worse mess. <laughs> Just saying, honor, on, you know, honest here. But there are times when I'm thinking, I'm going to do what I want anyway, right? Does... <laughs> does not give you good results, no. does not give you good results. No. <laughs> so we have a choice. So he's convicted by the Holy Spirit. So instead of killing Saul, he just cuts off a bit of his, his cloak. Mm -hmm. And then he comes out and he, and he yells into the cave and says, hey, Saul, you're in my power. And I could have done this, but I chose not to. He chose honour. Yeah. I mean, a bit late, but honour. <laughs> but it was the response that changed the outcome. Instead of killing Saul... David now still had a free path to the throne for himself. So we have to recognise that we actually, we, not demonic agendas or demonic technologies, but by the choices we make, which are either in agreement with God or in agreement with the flesh and the devil, change the outcome or keep it the way it is. Does that make sense? Yes. So David, he was on the run and he could easily have rejected mm -hmm. that conviction by the Holy Spirit, but he chose not to. And so things changed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I'm, I'm going to be extremely vulnerable right now and I'm not, don't ask me any questions about it. I'm not talking about it. I'm just going to be vulnerable to the extent that I want to be, okay? <laughs> How's that for open and transparent? <laughs> I am working through some stuff with, with the Lord and the Holy Spirit and Father now. And I'm very good at burying stuff. Like I'm good at burying the past. Like if it's happened, I'll bury it. And then I put the concrete on top of it and then an extra bit of concrete and then the blood. I can't disturb the blood. You know, like I said, it's there, it's buried. And, and God is wanting to deal with some stuff. And I'm saying, but it's buried. Like, it's buried. Like it's really buried. I don't want to open it up. I don't, want to, I don't want to open this up. I know if I open up, I'm opening up a whole heart of hurt. And like, it's buried. The heart's good. Let's leave it alone. The heart's good, you know. We're fine. Like, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So he said, you know, like, we're going to deal with this. And I went, no, nah, it's good. Let's just move on. You know, like we've got a world to take. You know, there's things to change. We've got a nation that's hanging in the thread, Lord. Seriously, we've got stuff to do, you know. We're going to deal with this. <sighs> no. Seriously. Seriously. So he, he gave me a date and he said, if you don't get this sorted by this date, you're going around the mountain again. And I thought, I haven't even been around the mountain. Like it's buried. How can I be around the mountain? <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
<laughs> so we're having this discussion, not one of my finest hours, but we're having this discussion. And then, then, listen to the outrage, then, I felt like Jesus slapped handcuffs on me and said, you're not going anywhere till this is dealt with. And I went, I don't want to deal with this. Like it's buried, right, okay? Done, deal, finished, over. <sighs> but he has this idea that he wants us whole. Like he wants us whole. <laughs> <laughs> I know. This is the Holy Spirit's dynamic power, hey? Oh, my gosh. And so, you know, I've, I've got this date looming and I've got this countdown, so many days left, and I don't want to go around the mountain again. I didn't even think I'd been around the mountain, but obviously. So there's stuff that he wants to bring out because it's going to stop us from moving forward. Yeah. Like, listen to yourself, Suzette. Okay, like, listen to yourself. Deal with it. Mm -hmm. so that you can actually move forward. Because I did not even have an idea that it was hindering me. Like it was that buried, that far in the past, that, you know, um, I honestly didn't even think it mattered. But obviously, it does. And so we all have stuff that we need to deal with. So just letting you know you're not by yourself. Oh, yeah. Please don't let me be by myself. <laughs> and so, you know, I had a I had a, a couple of days where the R was like reject, reject, <laughs> reject, <laughs> not interested, and then it was reaction, reaction. <laughs> now I'm kind of like resigned. <laughs> But I've still got a way to go to respond. <laughs> but it would change the outcome. Yeah. Now, I don't know what God is talking about. I don't know. I'm not, I don't really want to have the discussion. But obviously it's important to him. Yeah. Therefore, it needs to be important to us. Yeah. And so in, for all of us, like Cambry brought forward before, we have to um, allow the Holy Spirit to do the intense preparation in us that needs to be done so we can be right for the next yeah. season. Yeah. And all of us have areas of struggle. Mm -hmm. All of us have um, prayers that seem to have just hit the ceiling and bounced off and mm -hmm. never even made it into the Father's presence. All of us have um, soul wounds and heart hurts. And we all take, you know, we all have different ways of dealing with it. But the ultimate thing that the Father wants is wholeness. Yeah. And spiritually we might be whole. But soul realm and body realm might be a different thing. So it's, so I've been just saying to God, you know, I'm saying, I don't understand. I'm so good at saying this lately, the last week. I don't understand. I don't understand. I just don't understand. <laughs> but what I am saying now is, but I turn to you. I turn to you. I don't quite understand what you want. I don't quite understand where we're going. I don't quite understand the outcome that you have. I don't quite get any of this. I was happy the way it was. <laughs> but I turn to you. Yeah. I turn to you. And that's the thing. We either turn away or we turn to. And God is always turned to us. Yes, that's right. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are always turned to us with love. Um, with acceptance, with goodness, faithfulness, trustworthiness, with provision, always turn to us. Um, but now, you know, it's, the question is, where do we turn? And the trapped feeling can be really intense. Yeah. You know, when you feel trapped, when you feel there's no way out, when there's really no answer, when, oh, my God, I've done everything I know to do, I've prayed every which way I know how to pray, I've fasted, I've worshipped, I've stood on the word, I've humbled, I've done everything I know to do, but I am still feeling so trapped. It is such um, an intense imprisonment that, um, that we struggle with. And in that intense imprisonment of the soul, um, it's hard to see the light. It's hard to feel the presence of God. It's hard to experience the anointing. But in that intense imprisonment, 
there is a way forward. You just turn to God who is already turned to you. Mm -hmm. He has an answer for everything. So if you want to turn to 2 Kings, 2 Kings. <sighs> really humbling to think that what I just shared with everybody is going to be on YouTube. <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 20, you've got Hezekiah, verse 1. <clears throat> In those days Hezekiah became deadly ill. And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, came and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die. You will not recover. Talk about an event. God said. God said you're going to die. God said set your house in order. That looks like an event that is set in concrete. Yeah. But Hezekiah responded differently than reaction, rejection or resignation. Second Kings chapter 20 verse 2, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, I beseech you, Lord, remember now how I've walked before you in faithfulness and truth with a whole heart and done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. So he actually took hold of the event by his response in prayer to God. And this changed the outcome. Now, he didn't know it would change the outcome, but he prayed that it would. And the interesting thing with Hezekiah is that he turned his face to the wall. He turned his back to everything else. He refused to be affected by, I'm just going to, and, and what we, we, we talk about in the New Testament is cardionosis. Mm -hmm. And that actually means a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God. A lot of us have a soul realm relationship with God where we talk to him out of our mind, not out of our spirit or out of our heart. But cardionosis is a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God. A lot of, I'm not going to say a lot, but some Christians in the Western world have more of a mental relationship with God than a heart one. But cardionosis, heart-to-heart -heart relationship, and this is what Hezekiah did. He went heart-to-heart -heart with God. And he wept and he cried out to Lord. Heart-to-heart -heart relationship, heart-to-heart -heart, um, response to the event. And what happened was before Isaiah, verse 4, before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, Isaiah had not even left the palace. The word of the Lord came to him, turn back. And tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. So before Hezekiah had even left the, the, the palace, he hadn't even gone through the outer court, the word of the Lord came back to Isaiah and said, tell Hezekiah, I've changed my mind. I'm going to give him another 15 years. Heart to heart. Now there are times when it seems when God does answer those heart to hearts, and there are other times when it seems like it's a no go. But you continue to pray to the end. You do not give up and think, well, this is the way it is, nothing's going to happen. I just have to accept my fate. You continue to press in heart to heart with God. Heart to heart. And then in verse 6. God adds stuff, not just Hezekiah, you're going to live, but I'm going to add your life 15 years and deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant's sake. And then Isaiah comes with the healing of the, the, the cake of figs for the burning inflammation. And then Hezekiah says to Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me that I'll go up into the house of the Lord on the third day? And Isaiah said, this is the sign to you from the Lord that he will do the thing he's promised. Shall the shadow go forward 10 steps or go back 10 steps? And Hezekiah answered, it's an easy matter for the shadow to go forward. So let the shadow go back 10 steps. So Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord and he brought the shadow the 10 steps backward by which it had gone down on the sundial. So not only did 
the sentence of death be lifted off him, but he got an extra 15 years. He got um, the shadow, like all these miracles, the shadow went backwards. God, he healed him. Not only was he, you know, like you're going to live, but you're going to live well. He healed him. The shadow went backwards. God says, I'm going to defend you. I'm going to defend this city. Um, and then if you, you read in 2 Kings 19.35, an angel went out and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers to protect Jerusalem. Talk about an answer to prayer because he chose a response that was was. Con con consummate with what God wants, a relationship. The event plus your relationship with God will change your outcome. It's all about relationship. It comes down to relationship. And so it all comes, like with Sodom and Gomorrah, there was this heart-to-heart -heart between Abraham and God, but God for the sake of the 50, God for the sake of the 40, God for the sake of the 30, God for the sake of the 10, and God said, for the sake of the 10, I will reverse my decision. Mm -hmm. But Abram didn't take it far enough. He didn't say, well, what about just for Lot? So God is looking for a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. So this E plus R equals O, the middle thing there really, the R, should be relationship. Your heart-to-heart -heart relationship with him, with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Remember in Exodus 32 when Moses is up on the, on the mountain and he gets the, the tablets from God and he comes down and they're all worshipping the golden calf and having this amazing party and things are going on and God says, well, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to start with a new nation. Let's just start again, Moses. We're gonna, well, I'm going to have a new nation. Forget these guys. We're moving on to something new. But Moses, the event had happened. They had worshipped the golden calf. Moses is outraged as is God. However, Moses took his relationship with God to another level and pleaded before God. But what are they going to say about you, God, if you wipe this lot out and start fresh? What, what's going to happen to your name? Mm -hmm. And God changed the outcome. Thank you, Lord. Thank Jesus was handed five loaves and two fish and looked at 5,000 men plus women and children. Mm -hmm. So easy to think, well, this isn't going to work but a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with God. He lifted his eyes and looked up. He refocused. That's what that actually means. He refocused. And, and after the blessing from God came, the outcome changed because they had more than enough to feed the 5,000 plus women plus children plus 12 baskets over. So this is all, and in the past I've taught it's about um, the event plus your response or your reaction, but in reality, it is the event plus your relationship with God will change the outcome. Jesus with no wine, only water, no wine, turns to the Father. See, the thing is, and what we've got to understand, is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always turned to us. Always turn to us, yes. always looking over us, waiting for us. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, it, it wasn't when they re repented. God was right there, right there with them, offering a, a way out. You know, like all you've got to do, and, and Eve did the right thing. She said, oh, man, I was deceived. But Adam remain stubborn. So the, the thing is, God has always turned to us. You, if you haven't seen it, you Watch the um, Gospel in Two Chairs by Brad Jersick. goes for 30 minutes. We've shown it on a Wednesday night and it is absolutely awesome. The Gospel in Two Chairs, the 30-minute one, because that's the best one, and it's by Bradley Jersick. There are other people that do it, but he does it the best, I think. And it's just that God is always, we sin, we think God's not going to do anything till we repent. We sin, God has already done something. It was done through Jesus at the cross before the foundation of the earth. God is, is waiting, is, is turned to us. He's already turned. He's not waiting for us to repent. His love is right there. I've sinned. His love is right there. You know, um, I don't want to deal with this situation, Lord. I really don't want to deal with this. Well, you're not going anywhere till you do and I'm right here with you and I'm not going to let you alone and you're not going to walk it by yourself. 
He has always turned to us, always. He is so intimately uh, involved in every aspect of our life. He loves you so much. And it doesn't matter what we walk through, he is always there. But we sometimes feel like he's not or he's distant or he doesn't care as much as the word says he does. Or, you know, but the doctors have said this and, you know, um, whatever it might be. Or the bank account says this, or my employer says that, or um, the toxic relationship in my life, I just can't seem to get free of it. And let me just remind you, if you're copying things in a regular cycle from the demonic, it might not be bloodline, it might not be generational, but there are a lot of stalking spirits at the moment. So, you know, take authority over stalking spirits as well because they stalk in the spirit realm. That's why our lives need to be hidden with Christ in God. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to cover our tracks in the spirit realm at times. There are stalking spirits. Come on, people, wake up to the spirit realm. Cover the children. Yeah, and cover the children. But stalking spirits, if you can see it in the natural... It came out of the spirit realm first. Yeah. And stalking spirits are quite uh, elusive. You don't really know that they're there. You just know that you keep hitting the same brick wall or, you know, you just can't seem to get free of a particular thing. Sometimes it is not bloodline cleansing. Sometimes it is not courts of heaven. Sometimes it's just a plain old stalking spirit that we haven't picked up on who has tracked you in the spirit realm and knows exactly what's going on and exactly how to interfere. You'd be surprised the number of stalking spirits I have to cut off businesses. They just get to a certain level and bam, or this happens and bam, stalking spirit, deal with it and the business picks up. So it's recognising these things, but it's all about relationship. We can be trapped or we can turn. You can be caught in a pit of despondency or in delight. You can be sitting down or you can go through the door, Jesus. But, you know, God is nowhere. Put a space between the W and the H and nowhere and God is now here. I'm impossible. Impossible simply means I'm possible. Start moving things around. Recognise that you have the power and you have the ability to shift and to change whatever needs to be shifted and changed. Because in God's eyes, you are exactly the same as Jesus Christ. He is the elder. He is the firstborn son. But you have the same authority. You have the same um, power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in John Bevere's book, In the Holy Spirit, he said that you can minister to the same extent as Jesus ministered because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can minister as Jesus ministered on the earth as a man under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus did because you're a human being like he was under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can have the same relationship as the Father as Jesus. Jesus had as a man because you are a human being under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the same as Jesus. For goodness sake, when are we going to lift the limits off the way we think? And you might not know that God has a plan for your life. You might be wandering around in the fog thinking, well, I don't know what I'm called to do. There doesn't seem to be any clear path. Whatever I try to do falls apart. There's nothing for me. Well, that's exactly what you're prophesying over your life. Death and life come out of the power of your mouth. You either speak life into your situations or you speak death. There's no in-between. That's it. So if you don't know what to do, I am filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Yes. I'm filled with it. God orders my steps, so I'm naturally taking the right path for my future because God orders my steps. And instead of speaking, I'm confused. Oh, my gosh, you know what? It's so wonderfully clear to me because the Holy Spirit continues to unfold God's plan to my life. There were some books written by, I think the guy's name was Francis Martin, Strung by the Tongue and Loosed from the Noose. 
And they were all to do with the power of your words, self-prophetic words that come out of our mouth, that we speak over our lives, that actually constrain the angels, that the angels cannot move. So think about the spirit realm for a minute. And there's not as many demons as there are holy angels or anything like that. So he often works in clusters. And we, we know that if there's a suicide, quite often there's a cluster of suicides in the same group. You know, among the friends of the, of the child or whatever, there's a cluster. So often he works in clusters because there's, he's not enough demons to cover every person. So just in the spirit realm, think. Okay, I know I've got a guardian angel, at least two, yeah. maybe more. But I've got angels. Now, there might not be a demon assigned to me, but there could be a demon assigned to the business, assigned to the church, assigned to my family, whatever. Clusters, they work in clusters. Because quite often when you hear one person say, I'm so confused, you'll hear somebody else say, Man, I just can't get my act together. I can't see where I'm going. Infirmities and illnesses often work in clusters. You know, you hear of one person in your, in your group that's got cancer or something, and then you hear of somebody else and somebody else. Clusters. Think differently. Clusters. And so it's recognising that if, if I'm feeling confused, I'm not sure where I'm going, um, I'm not quite sure what's expected of me, which sort of sounds familiar at the moment, but, you know, that's what I'm thinking. If it comes out of my mouth, I have given the authority of my words as a king to the demonic to bring that to pass in my life. If I say, man, I'm so confused, I just don't understand what's going on, I just don't know where I'm going, I just seem to have lost my way. Guess what? Confusion reigns. I've lost my way. I end up in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. Stuff happens because that has come out of my mouth from a place of authority in my heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth is the compass of where you're going in life. However, if I'm feeling lost and I'm feeling confused, I can acknowledge that in my prayer closet like David did. My couch is dissolved with tears. My enemy surrounds me, he said in his prayer closet. But then there's that word selah, S-E-L-A-H. There's that place of, of interlude, that place of quiet, that place of listening. And then the next phrase of the, of the Psalms comes out with, but the Lord has spoken and his whole tone changes. So I can feel confused, unsure, not, not, you know, but I can say, you know what, regardless of what things look like, I just know that I'm filled with the knowledge of God's will, that he's directing my steps, that my steps are ordered by the Lord, that he holds my times in his hands, that he is unfolding his plan and his purpose before my life. It's the Holy Spirit's job to lead me and I'm just following. Yeah. And I have released life. Yeah. That's good. So we, there's only two things you release over your life, life or death. There's nothing else. There's no grey area. There's no Switzerland. There's no neutral place. It is only life or death. And if the Holy Spirit, you know, if we had a dollar for every negative confession we'd make, we'd all be millionaires. That's true. My back is killing me. <laughs> I'd do anything for a cup of tea. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> but, you know, we say things like that. There's, there's more month at the end of the uh, at the end of my paycheck than there is more whatever it is we say things, you know. And I was at the was God is so specific. The thing is, Jesus is the high priest of our confession. So that means, what am I confessing? What am I speaking? Am I speaking in agreement with God? or in agreement with the pits of hell, because there's no other place that I can agree with. It's either heaven or hell, blessing or cursing, life or death. That's it. So when the event happens, what comes out of your mouth, 
out of your relationship or your non-relationship with God or out of your on-off relationship with God or out of, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm Irish, Scott Irish, God have mercy, married an Italian. Can you imagine what that was like? <laughs> but if I go back to my old self, fiery, short-tempered, angry, Celtic. <laughs> but I'm a new creation. So if I respond out of my new creation, I will always release life, blessing, peace, provision, honour, respect. If I respond out of my old creation, anger, hurt, grief, loss, pain, devastation, confusion, all of those things, we have got to learn to live from the spirit. Think about that for a moment. Yeah. When you were talking about um, working in clusters. Yes, um, demons working in clusters. Are you relating that back to what we're speaking? Yes. Because he's the prince of the power of the air. Okay. And sometimes we come under where I used to work, only Christian, 80 people, non-Christian. And I would spend time with God, you know, and I'd cleanse myself and pray and I'm ready to walk in. I'd walk into the offices and I'm picking up pornography, lust, and I'm thinking, dear God, when the first few weeks I'm picking up all this stuff, anger and grief and everything, I'm picking it up and I'm starting to think it. And I'm thinking, but this is crazy. You know what? I have had time with God. I don't understand. So I had to spend time with the Lord. And he said, what you are doing is you're walking in an atmosphere that has not been consecrated to me. That atmosphere is under the prince of the power of the air. As that atmosphere is under the prince of the power of the air, what is released there are the clusters of the things that's operating in the people that work there. So if I'm picking up on lust or pornography, it is because it's in the people. But they work in clusters, you know, and, and, the, and thought bombs. And it's amazing sometimes when you look at the group of people that you hang out with, how many of you are going through the same kind of family issues, marital problems, or, you know, one will just come out of it and the other one goes into it. That often works cyclically. You know, in a group of people, um, one person's just gone through depression, they come out of it, the one with them has just gone. It, it works that way. So you need to understand there are clusters because he doesn't have an unlimited army like God does. He's a little bit more strategic than we are. I'm trying to connect some a scenario, um, and I feel like it's related, but I'm not making the connection. So there's a person who has, who knows friends, different times of his life that have committed suicide, and he's he's lived their experiences because they were all friends, mm -hmm. but. It, but it's like it's a huge span. I don't know if all the friends knew each other, but he's the common element. Um, I don't know how to answer that one. Okay. Um, but I do know that often with teenagers particularly, if one attempts suicide, then others do in the group around about the same time, within 12 months or so. So which might be a different kind of a thing than what you're saying. But sometimes, you know, people carry a spirit of death. Might not affect them, but it can affect the people around them. Yeah. The soul ties, I mean, maybe that he's loose words saying, oh my goodness, I hope no one else gets that close to me because I'll die. So if there's any agreement with that, that familiar spirit will follow him. Yeah. Yeah. So if he hasn't severed soul ties to that particular issue, the people and the spirits, then those things will follow. follow. They want to track. Yeah. So any place where there's a child. Stalking spirit. Yeah. Mm, stalking spirit. Stalking spirit. So. I think that's where I was going. I knew something that you were saying was connected. Yeah. To so this is where we've got to become sharper in the spirit to recognize the activities of stalking spirits, familiar spirits, ungodly soul ties. Sounds like we're talking a different language to some of you. But the reality of the spiritual realm is more real than the person sitting next to you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Beautiful thing is that there are more angels than demons. 
That's right. Yeah. And we can have supernatural crop failure over words <laughs> yeah. spoken over our Yes. Over so we're going to we're going to pray that. So is, does that kind of make sense? The e the event happens. Like there's nothing you can change. The event has happened. However, the R, your response, the relationship that you have will affect the outcome. Even with Hezekiah who should have died, not only did God heal him um, and say, well, I'm going to give you an extra 15 years, I'm going to save you, I'm going to save your city uh, and I'm going to um, get rid of the army that's come against you. Like, I mean, just amazing stuff. But God is looking for people who will react to him and respond to him from a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. Cardionosis, heart-to-heart -heart relationship, not out of my head. I often discuss things to him out of my head, but it's my heart that he wants. So one of the things that challenges me often when I go to other churches or mix with other, other ministry <clears throat> is I get statements like, oh, well, we prayed for healing, but they, it didn't happen. So I guess that, you know, oh, I guess healing's not for everybody, right? And that's wrong. That's wrong. Healing is for everybody. Now, Jesus went to the cross for everybody. Um, you know, and we, what we tend to do is we bring the word of God back to our experiences. You know, like it's, it's easy to do that. It was easy, but that's what I know. That's what I experienced. I prayed and that's what happened. But it doesn't mean that's the truth. It's an experience. And when I get concerned when people raise their experiences as the truth, because experiences can change. I might get a prayer answered today for somebody for healing, but not necessarily tomorrow. It just means that I'm growing in my understanding of being led by the Spirit, but God's will is everybody is healed. That's the will of God. Everybody is healed. Everybody prospers. Poverty was destroyed at the cross. Addiction was destroyed at the cross. You know, um, failure, frustration and fear destroyed at the cross. It's not the will of God that any should perish, but people perish every day and go to hell because they don't know that the salvation has been made available to them. And so we've got this thing where God promises this, but our experience is this, and it seems like there's no bridge between the two, but the bridge is Jesus and the bridge is faith. And the, and the thing is, I have to believe the the word of God above my experiences. Yeah. I have to believe the word of God above my experiences. Yes, and I agree. Otherwise, it's not truth. Mm -hmm. Circumstances change. Truth doesn't. And Psalm 51, 6 in the voice translation is absolutely beautiful. It says that God's truth is enthroned in our hearts. And I love the fact that God's truth is enthroned in my inner being and his wisdom is revealed to me. So we can respond, we can react, we can be resigned, we can reject. But how about we just delve deeper into our relationship? That God, even if I haven't seen the truth of your word for healing or prosperity or peace in the past, I'm drawing a line in the sand, the blood of the lamb, and I'm just decreeing that from this point on, I ask you to remove limitations, limited expectations. I ask you to remove um, the power of experiences to bring the word of God to no effect. I ask you, God, to deal with me in any way you see fit that I would live as Jesus lived on the earth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want to live as Jesus lived. Father, we hunger to see miracles, signs and wonders. But I think you are longing for the manifestation of it more than we are. So, Father, I ask that whatever it is in us, if we have any ignorance, any unbelief or any doubt, if we have any experiences or encounters that have caused us to live lower than you have called us to live, our belief system, our expectation or lack of, Father, we just bring the whole mess to you. 
And we ask you to bring us into the fullness of a relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we would live as Jesus did when he was a man on the earth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that we would see the hand of God move in power and might, demonstration, miracles, signs, wonders, people healed, delivered, set free, baptised in water, baptised in the Holy Ghost, baptised in the name of Jesus. We would see the lot of it. Father God, we hunger for the reality of the life that you have called us to live. And if anybody is like me and has stuff buried and under tons of concrete and then covered it with the blood of the Lamb, it, by your grace and by your gentle kindness, we surrender to you to do what you want to do in our lives, that in everything we bring you glory, that in everything we exalt the name of Jesus, that in everything we live by the power of the Holy Spirit, that in everything um, the good of the people around us are touched by the kingdom of God. Father, we don't desire to live a small life. We desire to live one that magnifies you, glorifies you, lifts you up, elevates you, positions you in the highest place. So Father God, we repent of anything and everything that we've done that is, has caused us to serve a small God in our hearts and in our minds. And we ask that you would move powerfully within us and upon us to bring us into that place that you've called each and every one of us to, whether it's individually or whether it's corporately. Father, for the people here and for the ones that are away, but God, we ask for a corporate move in Hope in Heaven Ministries International. We ask for a corporate move that as Jesus is, so would we be now in this world. Same image, mirror image, that Father God, God, you would uh, cause us to reflect him that we are so one with you that it's an effortless living of life because of the just the, the seamless union that we have with you through the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.